are going to talk about the spiritual warfare, and we want to know uh, spiritual warfare and how the enemy attacks, and also what kind of weapons God has given us, and with these weapons, we can continually enjoy the victory. So yes, there will be time that we will fall, but the Bible says a righteous will fall seven times, but we will rise up on the eighth times. And the end story, we already have a victory in Christ Jesus. We already have a victory. It's a given. So this battle is already won in Christ Jesus. And knowing that still, you know, the world is won. However, we go through some battles and there are some battlefields. And we want to understand this and we want to know this. Before I begin, I want to talk about three facets of the church. If you come to Thursday as a team members meeting, I sometimes share this or during our mission training times, I talk about this. Many years ago when I was uh, hired as a staff, Pastor Kim during the general devotion, he shared with the staff that are three facets within our church. The church is a family. And we all know this. Our God is the Father, and we call ourselves brothers and sisters. So we know the church is a family, family of God. And we all know about this. And all of us, especially church members, they want to focus on this family. Yes, we are family. Pastor Shine, love me as who I am. Don't discipline me. Don't rebuke me. Love me. Be a nicer pastor. And all of us want to Enjoy this comfort, enjoy this love and joy and all this. And when we have this family, even physical family, when we go home, there we can take off the mask and we can be comfortable and we can enjoy rest and we can be who we are. As a family members, probably that there's no condemnation. By, we can be ourselves. We don't have to put a mask. My children do not see me as a pastor. They see me as a father. And I can be a father for them. And just like that, our desire, our intention, our goal is within our church. We want to create the family environment that no one condemns anyone. There's no accusation. And I can be myself. And I can put my guard down and I can take my mask down and knowing that no one will accuse me, no one will speak behind my back and they will receive me as who I am. And as we endeavor to create a such environment, but we know that this perfect environment will be set when we go to heaven. But within church, we endeavor being Jesus being the center in the midst of us and enjoying the love of Jesus Christ. However, just like a family members, when they run the business, if they just be lenient to one another and everything is okay and acceptable and comfortable and rest, but that business will go nowhere and it will become so unproductive. So that's why there's a second facet of church. It's uh, being business because the church has a certain goal, and church has to have a, a reproduction of making disciples always. So it has aspect of being a business or being a company. It has to have some effectiveness and also efficiency of doing stuff because church is also an organization. Within organization, there's a goal. Within organization, there's a structure. Within organization, there's a purpose, and there's a method, and there's a strategy. Uh, so that's why within this organization, even though we want to be all like a family members, but there has to be certain management. Otherwise, this will be chaotic. We'll be going nowhere. And then there's a third facet of being a church that is being an army of God. Whether we recognize it or not, we are called to be army of God and we are in the constant warfare. 
in our minds and also in, in our relationships. And as much as we want to do the will of God, the more we want to do the will of God, there will be opposition. There will be attacks from our enemy. And we must be able to recognize that because now these attacks are not in the physical form. It comes in the physical form. It may come by the mouth of other people. It may come by environment. It may come with a different forms. But behind the scene, we must realize it's a spiritual warfare. It's a spirit, the serpent. The devil is also unseen physically. We cannot grab him. We cannot behold his eyes. And we must be able to recognize and be able to see who that is. And because we are in the spiritual warfare, the church is called to be the army of God. When we are called to be army of God, meaning there is an enemy. There is an enemy trying to attack us constantly, and we must conquer and win and gain the victory. Now, after I heard about this, it really made a sense to me. And then we realized as a GMI, as our church, out of these three facets, which phase stands most strongly among us as a GMI? What do you think? Do, we, do you think we are more like a family or do you think we are more like a company or do you think we are more like an army? When you come to our church, what do you feel like? Our church feel like, do you feel like this is a business or do you feel like this is a family or do you feel more like this is an army? At least from camp side, our reputation has been, this church is like an army. That has been our reputation. Some years ago, I have a cousin living in Southern California, nearby here. Um, she's, of course, married, and once we are talking, and after she found out that I was uh, serving as a pastor at GMI, and she made a suggestion as we were having a meal with uh, this couple, and she said, honey, she was talking to her husband, how about we join GMI? <laughs> and the husband said, are you sure about that? Are you ready to go to that church? You know what kind of church that is? It's like an army. Are you ready to forsake all of you have? And are you ready to serve? And are you ready to come to church at least three times a day and, you know, Give up all this time and money and, and go to missions and all that. Are you ready? Then she became silent. So until today, she hasn't joined GMI. She's attending a different church. And our church has been known strongly as an army of God. Why? It's, it makes sense because our church from the beginning has focused on the world mission. I don't know any of you have attended our church when we were located in Norwalk and we rented a facility from high school that was not being used. And I remember as I attended our church since 1991 and when we went there in the yard, there was a one building and this building was allocated to a multi-purpose room. And on the wall, there was a slogan. It was not seven slogan. It was a three slogans. And he said, mission is a prayer. Mission is a warfare. And mission is a martyrdom. And that was a slogan. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew that. And according to that slogan and our church setting, now we became more soft. We became soft. But back then, I can see, I can relate with those slogans. Mission is a prayer. A lot of people, day and night, were firmly prayer. And our church was known for praying church. And then mission is warfare. Yes, we were engaging warfare, spiritual warfare, left and right. We were known as uh, one of the heretics. Our church was isolated by other Southern California church because we were so fervent about mission or 
any, any kind of issues and things like that. And constantly, we would engage into warfare. Why? To engage into or the mission, you must engage into warfare. And then, mission is a martyrdom. Starting with the pastor Kim, a lot of pastors, they were ready to lay down their own lives for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. So, so these are the facets of the church. And however our church looks like, the church is a family, church is a company, and church is an army. Now, having said that, Pastor Igor Kim, who is a missionary to Israel, he also shared a different aspect of this church. If church is a family and a business and also an army, how do you need to become? As a Christian leader, how do you need to develop yourself as an effective Christian leader? If church is a family, then you want to become a father, spiritual father. If you are female, then you want to become spiritual mother. So we need to look at our lives and continually develop and become a spiritual father or spiritual mother. If church is a business, then you better learn to be a manager. So that's why a Christian leader not only becomes a spiritual father, but also he must develop his skill to, in the management because church is an organism and has a structure and you need to be able to manage that well. So that's why in administration, whether you are gifted or not, if you want to be used by globally, you better learn how to manage. And thirdly, if the church is called to be army of God, that means you are called to be a general. Not only you are father, not only you are a manager, but also you need to be a general and be able to engage effectively in the spiritual warfare. And that's where we come in. That's where we are going to talk about. Because all of us, whether we recognize it or not, we are called to war. We are called to war. So when we look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, this is a letter by Apostle Paul to Timothy. This is Apostle Paul saying to his spiritual son, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to prophecies which ran before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a, a good warfare. Timothy was overseer for the church in Ephesus. And Apostle Paul is encouraging him. There has been some prophecies over you. And you are gifted. You are anointed by God. And also that I charge you that you were a good warfare. Because Apostle Paul recognizes even serving in a church, it engages warfare. So you were a good warfare. That's what he says. Again, Apostle Paul says, to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not only Timothy was a teacher and a pastor, a Christian or a disciple, Apostle Paul is calling him, you are a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You must endure hardness. You are called to be the soldier of of Jesus Christ. And then as we know, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, verse 11 through 13, we will go over this later on. But here it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wires of the devil. Apostle Paul is encouraging all of us to put whole armor of God. Why? What do you mean by that? When do we put it armor upon our body. That's when we go to a war that we put the armor upon our body. And that's why spiritually, because we always engage into spiritual warfare, that God is asking us to put a whole armor upon you. Whole armor upon you. So whether we recognize it or not, whether we feel it or not, whether we sense it or not, we are in constant Warfare. We are in the war. Why? There's an enemy. 
there's an enemy trying to destroy us. From the Bible, we know that before we accepted Christ as a Savior, we were friends to the enemy, which was the devil. We were his slaves. Whatever he asks us to do, we were doing it. We were following the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and pride of the life. And as he beats us, we were slaves to the enemy. The moment we accepted Christ as a Savior, instead of that we were, en- we were slaves to the enemy, but now we become his enemy. We became friends to our God, the Father, and children of God. And that moment, instantly, we became enemies to the devil. And because we are his enemies, he will come to us to lie, to destroy, to kill, and to steal. And that's who he is. And we want to expose our enemy. To engage into spiritual warfare, not only we must understand who we are in Christ Jesus and who is backing us up, that's our God, but also we want to know our enemy. Who's our enemy? Enemy is the devil. And what kind of personality does he have? What's his goal? What kind of role does he have? What kind of power does he possess? And we want to know, what is his scheme? How does he attack us? How does he come to us and lie to us so that we may fall? And we want to understand this and we want to find out. And from the beginning, the Bible says in the book of John chapter 8, verse 44, Who is Satan? Who is this devil? Ye are of your father, the devil, Our Jesus is talking to Jewish people because they were opposing Jesus Christ. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. The devil is a father of lies. He doesn't have any truth in him. Whatever he speaks... Everything he speaks is a lie. Every single thing he says is a lie. He cannot speak the truth. He's against the truth. He is the father of lie. It's a lie. Now, if I go ahead of myself, he cannot do anything by his own power because he had is bruised by Jesus Christ. According to the scripture, on the cross, as it, Jesus died and resurrected, and his head had been broken, he cannot generate his own power. So the way he attacks us, the way he manipulates us is in our mind, whether through our feeling, through our ears, through our eyes, he will scatter lies into our minds. And when we grab our his lies and make a decision according to their lies, and that's how... He makes us fall. That's how, because he has no power. He scatters lies into our mind. And when we dwell in such a lie and we grab it and we make a decision according to that lie, and then we experience consequences. And these consequences are negative consequences in our life. So what happens? Why does he lie to us? Why does he lie to us? What is the purpose of him lying to us? It's very clear. Again, in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, here it says, Jesus is saying about devil again, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus' purpose of coming to us is to give us life and life abundantly instead of the thief the liar, father of lies, devil, Satan comes to steal, to destroy, and to kill. That's all he does. The focus, the purpose is to steal, to destroy, and to kill us. How? By giving lies. By putting lies into our mind. And that's why the Bible constantly beating us, meditate the word of God day and night. Dwell your heart in truth. Speak the truth in love. 
That's why we must constantly, constantly renew our mind, renew our hearts, and dwell and soak our hearts into the truth. Why? Because lies constantly will come to our mind through media, through word, through the people, and through my flesh, through my emotion. Always, always lies being scattered in my mind. And when I grab it, and when I make a decision according to it, then stealing, destroying, killing happen in my life. My peace and my joy and my love has been stolen. Sometimes the physical possessions can be literally stolen. My authority can be stolen. Peace can be stolen. How do we know that? Actually, how it has happened, we can see it from the book of Genesis. From the beginning, his tactic, his scheme never, never changed. He always starts with a lie. God speaks the truth to us. To Adam and Eve, he said, the first word he spoke to human beings is a truth from our God, the Father. He comes to Adam. You can eat all the fruits in the Garden of Eden, but there is a tree in the center. That is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when you eat of it, you will certainly die. That's the truth. Whatever comes out of mouth of our God, he is full of truth. He cannot lie. The Bible says our Father, our God cannot lie. Everything he says, it's completely opposite from the devil. Everything he says, anything he says out of his mouth, because he cannot lie, everything is given to us in truth. Truth is spoken. Whether we like it or not, forgive, pay good with the, for the evil, it's not good for us. It's not sweet to our ears. But that's the truth. That's the truth. Whether we like it or not, it's the truth. Everything coming out of the mouth of our Father is the truth. So truth has been declared to these people, to the couple. And guess what happens? Very first thing, what the devil does, he will challenge the truth has been spoken to the people with the lies. And he does it even until today. His tactic never, never changes. It's always consistent. The reality is, he's a dumb, he's so stupid because he cannot be creative. And his method is always consistent because he cannot be creative. He cannot alter, change, and come up with a creativeness. But the reality is, People, generation after generation, for thousands of years, will fall into the same tactic that Satan has been using for thousands of years. And that's also amusing. That's really amusing. So let's look at the book of Genesis and revisit that. And we know the story very well. Book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, knowing the truth has been spoken, because when God said it, you will certainly die, what is a prerequisite? What's a presumption there? That means we were created as an eternal being. Life has been already given to us. Because God give, gave us life, but when you eat that fruit, you will certainly die. That's what God said. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the women, yeah, has God said, you shall not eat up every tree of the garden. He's twisting God's word with the lies. And verse 2, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat up the fruit of the trees of the garden. Can you go forward? But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. God never said you cannot touch it. So in that conversation, truth is a twisted and lie is invited. And Eve, as we know, takes a lie because the lies, you will not die. You will not die. The verse 4. You shall not die. 
Surely you are not I. But instead, when you eat of it, verse 5, God knows that in the day you thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be like a god. You will not die. The lie has come in. And the Eve will eat that fruit. So he do, she dwells in that lie and she makes a decision. When truth was spoken, you shall not eat that fruit. But the lie was spoken. You will not die. It will be okay. It will be okay. When you eat it, your eyes will be open. You will be like a God's. And with that lie, she chooses instead of grabbing the truth, she chooses to grab the lie and act and decide upon that lie. And then all the flood of consequences will happen to her life and to her husband and generation after generation. We eat the consequences of holding the lie. And that method has constantly been used by the devil. Always, always. The lies will be spoken to our ears and in our hearts, in our minds. There will be always wrestling between truth and lies, even as a Christians, because he will put darts in our minds with the lies. And when we lose a discernment, and when we act according to those lies, the consequence is what? Stolen, destroyed, and killed. That's what it is. That's as simple as the spiritual warfare we constantly engage now, as the devil puts lies into our mind, but there's a weapons he uses, and he doesn't have that weapon. Only weapon he has is probably the lie, any lie. But on our side, what's been prompted is in our flesh, is in our flesh. And let's look at the Bible here. And verse 6 the way we responded with the lies, the woman, when the woman saw that tree was good for food and that it was a pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit thereof and did it and gave also unto her husband with her and he did it. Here, there are three physical responses that we see from Eve. One is, the tree was a good for food. What is it? Lust of our flesh. Second, that it was a pleasant to the eyes. Lust of eyes. Then it was desire to make one wise, a pride of life. That's our physical response to the lies, and we give in to that temptation. And consequences will happen in our lives. And where does it say? In the first John chapter 2, verse 16, and it describes, Apostle John categorizes it distinctively, and he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So I will respond to the lies that we will give in to the temptation, to the lies, because we respond our lust, lust of the flesh, lust of our eyes, and pride of our life. And when we go back, how Jesus was tempted, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. How was Jesus tempted? It's so strikingly the same because God purposefully portrays the temptation of Jesus Christ alluding us back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Why? The first Adam, first Adam failed miserably by the temptation of Satan. And with a lie, they took it and they gave in because of their lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And Jesus, in the book of Matthew, chapter 3 and chapter 4, and he goes a similar temptation of the devil. Never, never changes his tactic. Why? 
Because heaven is opened up when he went inside the river of Jordan, baptized, and he came up. And there are three trying God manifest at the river of Jordan. There's a son Jesus coming up from the river. And then there's a Holy Spirit descending upon him. Then heaven opens up. The voice of God speaks to him. What does he say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God declares this truth over this son. Just like he first said to Adam, first Adam, you shall not eat that fruit. Otherwise, you will certainly die. That was the first voice from the Father. That was the first truth spoken to the human being. Now, second Adam, Jesus, to Jesus, he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, when he is led by the Spirit to the wilderness, how does Satan attack him? How does he try to bring the lies to the mind of Jesus Christ? What does he say? What does he say? He comes and he says, if you are the son of God. Right now, right before it, God already declared, you are my son. You are my son. God already declared that Jesus was the son of God. Immediately in the wilderness, with that truth, Satan will come with the lies and puts a question mark with a doubt if you are the son of God. What do you mean if? Our God, my father already declared, I am his son. I am the son of God. That with that truth, he twists it and brings lies into it. And then physical response, the three ways is the same, identical. Make this stone the bread, the lust of the flesh. And I will show you from the top of the mountain the glory of the word, that lust of the eyes. And then from the pillar, pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself because God will catch you, the pride of life. Because I'm so distinguished. I am so different from other people. I'm the chosen one. I'm different. I'm better than the other. And God will protect me by twisting the truth. The Satan uses our physical response. Lie comes and we respond it with our flesh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And we fall for it. But our second Adam, Jesus, became victorious. Because he went through the temptation and he was able to overcome that. And immediately afterwards, he was able to minister God and his people. And that's why, why is a spiritual warfare, why winning spiritual warfare is so vital in our Christian life. Why? Because unless we overcome temptation, unless we lead a victorious life, we cannot serve God and we cannot serve his people. Jesus, after, he was already filled with the Holy Spirit. But after he overcame those temptations, God was able to send him for the public ministry. And as we overcome the temptation of the enemy, and we lead a victorious life, then God can continually use us to serve other people, minister other people, to preach the gospel, and to make a disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us all stand. We will continue on with a spiritual warfare. As we heard at the intro how the devil comes to us with the lies. And we will talk about the sword of spirit is the word of God. And because lies are put upon our minds, that we need to fill our hearts and our minds with the truth and constantly and soak our mind and my heart with his truth. No wonder the general Joshua, when he was ready to conquer the land of promise, the land of Canaan, with his army, army of Israelites, 
that God, instead of equipping him how to use a sword, how to shoot an arrow, he only said, be strong and be courageous and meditate my words day and night. No wonder the only commandment given to this army general was not how to use a sword, was not how to defend himself in the warfare. He commanded him, meditate my word day and night. Because that's the greatest spiritual weapon. Whether we recognize it or not, we are in the spiritual warfare. When we win, we must win. We must win battles. When we win the battles, there are spoils we can enjoy. There, was, there are rewards. When we are defeated, there are consequences. Yes, God is gracious. Yes, God will uplift us again. There are consequences that we must go through. But our God's desire is to stand firm and be victorious. So let's call the name of Jesus three times and ask God, God, make me great, powerful spiritual warrior. Help me to win the battles. Lord, equip me, protect me, anoint me, use me, use me as a spiritual giant and general and warrior. Let's call his name. One, two, 